Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's see what the paper is. Clinical characteristics and short-term outcomes of severe patients with COVID-19 in Wuhan, China. Okay, so this p-value has to be attached to certain conclusion, right? Yeah. Let's open the, the article. Well, oh, the link is broken. That's great. But let's see. That's what I would think, yeah. Oh. Uh, so I assume there is some conclusion in this paper, and let me find by DOI. Uh, hmm. That's interesting. Not even a good DOI. I should be able to find it. Hmm. That looks like it, right? I don't know, does it? Yeah, that's the one. <coughs> okay, so it's on PubMed and there is conclusions. Patients with elder age, chronic comorbidities, blah, 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 uh, might increase the risk of poor clinical outcomes. Well, in the, in the uh, results above, um, I mean, they're not giving the p-values there. In the results part, is there so, a so it's like the, the results part has all kinds of interesting numbers, but mm -hmm. that's not coming out in your table, or at least I don't think it did. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Sample. Well, what, what's our, because these tables are actually done by manual uh, work. These were not created by AI. Oh, I just don't understand. Um, you know, the, what I would want to know is this part, this results paragraph. Yeah. Not some random p value in the middle of a table. So that, that was just my gut. And um, this is helpful because, like, now it doesn't make any sense to me. Like, exactly. Before it kind of did, I just assumed it made sense for scientists. But even though you're not a scientist, but like just general logic doesn't work here no oh, and then you guys were talking to the people yesterday about hey who wants to go in and check these papers and check these numbers i was like i wouldn't volunteer for that because it seemed meaningless but <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay i'm a very straightforward person <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm too i really appreciate that but somebody had commented basically what i'm saying that's why i felt more confident saying this somebody commented this on okay. one of the I threads I was reading, it. basically said, you know, these numbers aren't helpful. Um, okay. And I thought, okay, somebody. Yeah, and you uh, maybe the context of it all will uh, help you. So I haven't come up with this structure, and Corona Y haven't come up with this structure, but Kaggle did was a couple of doctors, and there was this comment of mine where uh, where I actually questioned the validity of this format and approach and they weren't really explicit about like who provided that so um, i kind of got led by assumption that there was someone meaningful because they they claim to be working with like white house ellen institute for ai uh, who organization and things like that so maybe that's actually a wrong format and we need to assemble a real group of you know, researchers that are, you know, uh, specialized in, in COVID-19 and could uh, drive us to a much better uh, format. Well, the other thing is, I don't know if this has come up and I, I don't know if this is being done right now, but there's a whole movement in publications for open data. And so- And it sucks. <laughs> Sorry? And it sucks. Like the thing is that these publications are not opening the, the papers. And the only reason Cord19 exists is because Semantic Scholar and Allen Institute for AI kind of made a deal with certain publishers to give that data to them. But it's not even, they're not allowed to publish it in full because it's like it's forbidden by that license. Or oh, wait, this is. Uh, they just got the papers, but there's a lot of journalism journals these days when there's a lot of data involved, they require the actual data in a data readable format to be made available. 
uh, as when somebody publishes something so that other people can reproduce the results if it's just a data crunching thing. So there's a, a whole, um, I know this is because uh, the magazine I edited was, you know, I'm not an expert in this, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a big, you know, when big data is involved, there's a lot of, um, been a lot of talk anyway about oh have you seen the recent buzz and issue about the fact that uh, the hydroxychloroquine uh trial data is actually uh private data that no one can explain and reproduce and like there is a big like uh what, what's mean the one that found it not not effect that it was da dangerous that one uh it's actually in corona wide here uh Okay, so summary, who are canceling studies of hydroxychloroquine use based on the study in Lancet showing it's ineffective and harmful? Problem is based on analysis of big data stored in commercial database, Australian hospitals can't align their own data with the study's output. They don't know who provided the company with hospital data and the company won't release the data. It's not open data. Mm. Kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess what I was trying to say is Extracting tables from conclusory pa papers, uh, you know, maybe it's nice to some extent, but what is really useful for other researchers is the actual data. I guess that's not what you guys are trying to do. You're trying to do a literature review. You're trying to provide the process summary. of yeah uh, of scanning through all of this uh, you know data set because. Like we, we don't want to formulate conclusions or findings. We want to put all the dots on the map for people to connect it. Right. Okay. So you wanted me, you were asking me initially to write up, let me see if there was another question I had first. Uh, oh, before I get to the, what you're looking for me to do. Um, so the, there were doctors, I guess, who identified the key scientific questions, and I thought that was pretty cool. So the domain experts are actually yeah. guiding you there, which is <laughs> yeah, much better than uh, machine learning engineers thinking what's um, and and so, but it's not all the possible questions that could be asked, of course. And then it also sounded looked like um, you've only managed to get through I don't know eight thousand or some still a small fraction of the papers, right? Yeah, because yeah. it's still manual process but there isn't there some step that's not manual well the pre-filtering is automated but then the actual review process the wow. formulation of tables is still manual because we only got these tables like two weeks ago and that's the the big push of Kaggle to actually use this benchmark and try to create AI that will generate more tables but in a way especially after hearing your feedback <laughs> it, it's completely useless and meaningless exercise i i don't i'm not saying it would no no but i, I think not some way to make it useful but what i was looking at in the current format it's i think useless because even with that p-value without any conclusion and no way to even understand what conclusion was it's completely out of the place I maybe that's what I thought but the the sample size one I, like I said mm -hmm. I thought that was great like if I'm looking through a list of of papers and it you know and there's adoption to dig deeper into one with 13 people and one with 6,000 people I'm gonna look at the one with 6,000 <laughs> yeah um usually so I do okay. think that there's some useful information there that you guys are extracting and that's from tables or from text or you don't, I don't, or is that so, manual? Right now it's manual, but the attempt is to have, you know, a week from now or two weeks from now, something that works with clinical trial uh, papers and tabular data to extract sample size uh, and all the numbers, number type of data. Yeah, so that, but the numbers that you need are gonna be different depending on what's being studied. True. I don't know what the actual numbers. We, we're starting with sample size and p-values, but I it, it sounds like we should only start with sample size. <laughs> well, but there's a bunch of other stuff in that 
in those columns severe something and mm -hmm. I don't know what those are. Yeah, and and those were formulated by actual like medical professionals and well, maybe they do mean something. I and maybe the p value relates to them. I but I don't know. So I you know, maybe yeah. there's more sense there than I'm than you and I can figure out. Yeah, maybe. But it seems like it's taking a lot of work and you better make sure it's worthwhile. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, so you wanted me to write something up just like basically what came out of that phone call or was it more like it seemed to me maybe you already have this a direction of what we're trying to accomplish and conceptually how we're trying to help researchers based on because again um, and maybe it would it would have been more helpful if yesterday we talked about these columns in detail about the p-values and other stuff but conceptually it felt that so many things resonated was researchers and it felt like we we're creating or we have a chance to create something that is useful it, because the people on the call other than you were actual researchers yeah yeah i didn't hear them really responding to the tables what i heard was the the asian woman mm -hmm. uh, Kong. saying that she would like to know where in the paper this is what i thought she was saying where in the paper are her keywords showing up? Mm -hmm. Are they in the abstract or the introduction or the results? Um, because she says if they're in the introduction, <coughs> they may just be background. If they're in the results or the abstract, they may be what she wants. So she, she was trying to, I think, say what was most relevant. That's what I heard her saying. Yeah, and that's relevant. Yeah, you're, doing full, you're doing full text search, not just titles. Like PubMed's just titles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's where you can really dig in and do things like, uh, and then the other guy was saying he most wants to have the things at the top that are the most relevant. Well, that might be things like the papers that use his keywords more often than other papers or. And so. here's where I think that relevancy is, um, you know, I, I always say that there is no objective knowledge. It's always subjective because there is data and then you derive information within the context of use of this uh, data and i yeah. think that might be the case with researchers and that's my hypothesis it's our job to reduce uncertainty of the environment to things that are relevant to this specific uh, direction of research because if alex that uh, younger uh, researcher guy he's a molecular um, uh, guy, if he cares about like sell something, blah, 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 then, you know, keyword that is more about, um, you know, molecular angles is more relevant. Um, if papers are of molecular studies, you know, something like that versus, right. uh, like social, sociological studies or like social aspect of it, or like public transport, or there are even, uh, articles about stock market in court 19. Mm. Uh, which is ridiculous. I, I, Not yeah. really. But <laughs> <laughs> so, but they shouldn't be in PubMed if they're about to stop. <laughs> but um, oh, they'd be in the cord thing. I get it. But yeah. So I don't know the other the things that would help. Rank, this is what I heard him say. Things that would help to just determine if it's relevant to him. He wants them to rise to the top of his list. So that might be that he needs to have the, the number of times the word molecular appears in the paper or mm -hmm. the number of, or some other features <coughs> that AI could easily count of, or natural language processing can handle. Um, yeah, and maybe it will be helpful for me to quickly show you the, uh, <clears throat> our first uh, attempt that we submitted to Kaggle uh, back in April, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which was, um, we had three different tasks, risk factors, uh, drug exploration, and, um, and transmissions, uh, transmission incubation and environmental stability. And so three of the, these tasks uh, and teams were operating in, in this creative redundancy type of mode, which uh, allowed them to pursue the same objectives in different ways and that was really beautiful because 
you know, it typically doesn't happen in the corporate environment or like a research environment. It's mm -hmm. considered to be a waste of time. But here it was very beneficial because three teams discovered three ways to navigate the data set that, mm -hmm. that are very unique. And um, here's a, a case study for this risk factors uh, team. So basically they stumbled upon feedback and uh, I think a physician told them to try to use not just keyword, but engrams. Uh, are you familiar with engrams are? Mm -hmm. So it's combinate like phrases versus singular oh. uh, words. Yeah. And um, so they generated uh, engrams for different uh, risk factors like heart disease. Um, so basically they had medical subdomain like heart disease in the ICD code and as output, they would have a list of engrams that are relevant to it, like the aortic valve, stenosis, rheumatic, blah, 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 congestive heart failure, which uh, allowed them to actually search much better because they weren't just searching for heart disease as a keyword. They were searching for this entire um, space dimension of different relevant things. Mm -hmm. So what they did, they search, did initial search for relevant papers and then they had medical uh, professionals annotate which papers were truly relevant or not. So that allowed them to create a snapshot of output where um, they would see how many times keyword was uh, matched. And it was also, uh, let me show you the beginning of it where Yeah, it's a, it's a long one. Yeah, so here uh, you can see the heart disease risks. Um, we identified 119, uh, 39 papers relevant to the risk factor for score 19. And this was back when data set was 25,000, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, this is a visualization of engrams, which is like heart failure, significant, like all of the, the things that are relevant to heart disease in a way, like diabetes, something, cardiac arrest. Um, again, also not like final and not completely uh, correct, but better than just heart disease as a keyword. And then uh, you would see number of keyword occurrences, uh, the actual engram that uh, was producing this result, like heart disease or congestive heart failure and others, and they would be ranked by number of keyword occurrences. Mm -hmm. And it produced quite interesting results in terms of it was much better than any of the like search engines um, out there. Okay. So that was kind of the first exploration of uh, relevancy in search. Mm -hmm. And I think the next step, the one that, because we already have this, we just don't have interface to, to expose this to researchers. Um, the next step is actually, you know, bridging a search function with being able to skim through these papers much more efficiently than opening each PDF and reading 10, 10 pages. Because even if you retrieve 20, top 20 relevant results, you still need to figure out which ones are, you know, truly relevant, not just by keywords, but by the data that you're looking for, like sample size or values or I, I don't know something well you probably do have to read a bunch of them or at least the abstracts after you filter let's say top 10 right out of 100 like you most probably will have 10 that you will absolutely need to read mm -hmm. but to make decisions what to read and how to spend your time when you're overwhelmed with data that's the key problem that we want to solve and that's where tables kind of got interfered because they were the interface of how people typically do scientific literature review. They organize excerpts or like parts of articles in tables. Yeah, right. I saw in that one of the chat things I was reading before I got on that some people were just talking about, you know, can't we just do like a snapshot of the, of the tables? Because mm -hmm. usually almost every, paper is going to have a key table or figure that is like explains the whole thing mm -hmm. not always but often yeah there's some key 
uh, thing that if you just look at that, you'll be like, oh, I get it. We even oh. ideated a name for this uh, feature. We, we call it Lens, so Core 19 Lens. Like, uh -huh. So you don't have to read entire paper and you just click Lens and it shows the most important part of it or something where the data came from. And again, it's also a complex uh, feature to figure out both you know, in terms of development and in terms of knowledge retrieval. Yeah. But yeah, this is, this is definitely the, the scope of like the flow. We want to filter stuff, find the most relevant stuff, allow researchers to skim through it, identify top X papers to actually read, and then have them sneak peek in, into these articles to verify their you know, need to read those. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense now, or more yeah. sense? Um, so, uh, what about, I mean, did some of the Kaggle people use, I know there's a bunch of ontologies in biomedicine. Mm -hmm. Like, it seemed like the engrams, there's probably an ontology for cardiovascular that could have given you the the phrases to just add to the search or something. So what we have right now, we have enriched a data set with um, some uh, named entities. So we use UMLS um, to kind of uh, unified medical labeling system okay. to bubble up all the possible ways things are named, like ab abbreviations like HCQ um, becomes hydroxychloroquine and things like that. We also have Bell, um, which is some ontology engine or something. Uh, Bell Medical. Let me let me find. Again, I'm I'm super dumb in these things, so it may not make any sense. Oh, I did see that. Biological expression language, and I think we're using this to enrich data set. Um, not even sure how it works. Okay. But uh, yeah, there are ontologies that exist for all of these things. And that's the part that um, Kara on the call, neuroscientist, was really excited about because essentially we can build these knowledge graphs that explain ontologies, how things connect. And even if we don't build causal inference, like causal connections, you know, like hydroxychloroquine inhibits something, blah, blah, blah. That's deep. Uh, we're very far from, from that, okay. but just explaining that hydroxychloroquine is anti-malarian and then there are other anti-malarials and they bubble up into quinones or quinones or, or something, you know, th those names that don't make it any <laughs> sense. Um, the knowledge graph idea was interesting. I mean, you, you popped up just a picture of one and, and I think people really responded to that. Yeah but I'm not sure how you're going to include it. Yeah, because you know why knowledge graph idea uh, resonates? Because that's how we kind of have mental construct of things in our head. And it's just like things connect and they interconnect in many ways. And there is no objective representation of knowledge. And it's always subjective and defined by what you're looking at. Kind of like quantum mechanics uh, type, mm -hmm. type of uh, idea that you define the, the environment whenever you measure it. So yeah, uh, again, I, I truly believe that we're very close to cross this chasm in terms of necessary technology. But what I cannot figure out is the interface and the ideal interface for all of that. And yesterday call was very helpful, uh, helpful in the direction. But the thing that I wanted your help on is to help us figure out how to communicate all of these amazing ideas, even if we don't have them yet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm thinking about just, I don't know, I couldn't tell from the side, I was sort of digging around like, do, does each project have some kind of statement of purpose, the problem, the proposed solution, the challenges, and some kind of document that could be a living document that would be kept alive and kept up to date. 
Yeah, so the best thing that we have so far is this document called Daily Progress. And yeah, I kind of looked at that and got totally boggled. <laughs> it's it's wormhole for sure. Um, <laughs> you know what? I think there are projects document, kernel wise teams and projects. Let's see. Mm, okay. Well, this is helpful in a way, but it's outdated, extremely outdated. Um, what are you in now? Yeah, that's the, the one that is outdated. Um, oh, that's supposed to be the projects? Yeah, I think, okay, I think the other one, products and services. Yes, this one. Because we start con conceptualizing things as products and services to make it easier to understand. And uh, yeah, this discovery engine is empty, AI power literature review is empty, but for example, vaccines and therapeutics, see the Kaggle round one, which happened April 16th, was um, drug treatment extraction tool. Um, this tool help answers the question which drugs are being used to or considered for COVID-19 treatment. Mm -hmm. For round two, there are actually multiple projects they're working on. I think four, yeah, four. So, so. Dan Sosa. Dan Sosa, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's and, the one I talked to before I came on. Oh, nice. He's great. I mean, his ability to manage four projects uh, that are like completely different and it, it's quite amazing. Yeah, he seems to. That's what um, I was talking to Russ Altman, who's his supervisor and uh, as a grad student, and he said. Dan has these madam management chops that he brought with him that are just blossoming under this project. Yeah, which is, you know, extremely fluid organization, global collaboration of extremely yeah. intelligent people without structure or, or a boss or, you know, guidance. It, it's not an obvious kind of way to function in the world where people come at you with like, I think I'm going to work on this. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's yeah. into the big picture. <laughs> I mean, is that kind of what happens? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And it's fascinating and truly beautiful and very inspiring to look at. Uh, truthfully, I don't even know what these uh, projects like Dan Sosa wants. I know that the uh, knowledge graph that Jeremy Zucker is working on is more about um, the next step for causal inference. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is exciting project, though very, very hard. Mm -hmm. Pharmacy dashboard. So this is just expanding the um, the tools, the drug treatments that are being used. Um, drug meta science. Where does this specific paper fit with the, the rest of the literature? Oh, this is about con finding contradictory claims uh, mm -hmm. to previous findings. So extract contradictory claims, analyze and summarize sentiment of tweets discussing a specific query drug related article. That's interesting. Because a lot of researchers apparently go to Twitter to mm -hmm. either bash or like, yep. you know, yeah, you, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're trying to extract that data and actually include it um, into the data set so that you can see if the article is not just popular, but has a lot of negative sentiment to it. Huh. Yeah, genomic proteomics visualization tool. I have no idea what this viral proteins, this is beyond my general understanding of biomedical stuff. Mm -hmm. So risk factors, it's actually the same a team that was working on heart disease stuff and they're just doubling down on, on the existing stuff. We need to fill this out. Pandemic forecasting, this is the project where um, Isaac is modeling uh, the actual um, forecasting of the cases. And they're also ingesting patient data, I think, since yesterday. Um, yeah, there is mortality forecasting. There is, well, explainable AI is, is a completely like detached from COVID-19, but it's also for us to be able to trace like how we make certain AI decisions and how it all works. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, I hope this helps, but it like you're you're right. There is so much stuff, and it's hard to synthesize uh, something meaningful. And especially when dealing with extremely complex topics, I find it impossible for for me to even write like an article. You know, what mm -hmm. exactly are we doing right now? And yesterday's video was the most concise and the most, like, I, I guess we've discussed many things, but they were all within the context of this uh, something where you go into and you find things that you don't know exist. And it's generally helping you reduce the information overload. Yeah. Yeah, well, there was this part of the conversation where I was, I, I under, totally understood the idea that you might find things that you don't know exist, but it wasn't clear to me why that would be the case with this method. Like you did mention that clinical trials are not being found in PubMed without your filtering system. Yeah, but is so there that's, that's, filtering that's finding stuff that people wouldn't otherwise find? So here's an example that uh, uh, Olya on, on the call gave. When she was doing research, she was stumbling upon things that are not necessarily part of her research, but the ones that explain different processes or are relevant to what she's studying. And then, uh, you know, that knowledge kind of stacked up and helped her proceed with her own research. So oh, she, she found that because of your thing? No, no, that's just because she used many different tools and she uh, assembled, you know, things from here, things from there, from PubMed, from other source. And then she learned that, hey, there is this uh, factor or there's this process in like, I don't know, in something and it helps her. So just ha having that knowledge graph that shows related things or things that might be of interest to like molecular scientists or if that's uh, being used by neuroscientists showing some connections to like Alzheimer or like Parkinson's disease or you know potentially herpes 6 virus that is being connected with Alzheimer's in in some research you know things that you don't necessarily even you can't really google for that because you don't know there is this connection right. and that analogy that I was giving was sport cars. Like for yeah. you to be able to find information about sport cars, you need to know that phenomenon exists. Yeah, but so I'm, I guess I'm asking is how does this review process help people get to that, get to the unknown? The current form of it does not. And okay. we're probably two weeks away from it. But I do want to explain explain it mostly because I want to hear feedback and not make, uh, m m you know, not spend too much effort building things that are biased by a very small group of researchers and our, uh, you know, guess, guesses. So you mean you will have, there's some way that something you're doing is going to lead to that ability to do a knowledge graph that connects yeah well basically the tables i think are the kind of foundation so we have filtering filtering gives us ability to say which things are you know related to which topic then we have uh, quantitative data from tables and we can map uh, different things to it and then we have a tool that actually extracts uh, qualitative data and extracts entities let me show you uh, how it works. Mm. Okay, found it. So this doesn't make any sense to me, but this is our first attempt to uh, parse article um, into specific like entities and, and things. It's like IBV type, is gene or gene product uh, long loop two is prodding I, I don't know I'm not even sure if that's correct and that's why we need more people participating and uh, correcting things but uh, that's basically something that will lead to our ability to connect all of these things so the 
you know, the things that talk about gene product stuff will help us filter uh, by gene direction, like geneticists or epigeneticists will benefit from articles that mention this. And then IBV type will definitely be connected to something uh, else. Let's see if we can find any, uh, like something. Yeah, like something this or, yeah, but it's very hard for me to navigate this because. Hey, hey somebody was searching for, I don't know, SARS-13, whatever that is. And uh, in a knowledge yeah. graph, it might connect them with something else in this paper that they had no idea. Correct. And so that's not a knowledge graph. That was like literally parsing a sentence or something. Correct. Named entity recognition. Named entity recognition. That. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of complex things, and it's it's actually fascinating how people that have no idea about how things work are able to even like navigate this. Uh, yeah, I mean, like machine learning engineers from like Amazon or like Google and other places are exploring this and genuinely trying to learn this stuff obviously that, that sentence would mean nothing to them it doesn't mean anything to me yeah but uh yeah so that's that's the challenge is how do you find something useful if you don't know what's useful yeah but um that's why i want to write a something like a, even one pager or maybe a couple of pages um, and we can push that as a medium article. I have big following. I can push it through LinkedIn and just attract more people that could read it and be like, Hey, this makes sense. Or, Hey, this doesn't make any sense. And you guys are wasting your lives and you should do <laughs> something else. Okay. If you can help well, us craft something. I, I can bring something up. I don't know if it's a medium article yet. If I was going to do that, I would approach it a little differently, but because um, I thought you were just wanting something internal. We can but, start from uh, internal because we still have plenty of people that don't understand what we're doing. Believe <laughs> it or not, like that's a thing. Well, no, I totally believe it because I joined the website yesterday and I was like, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Um, and I'm totally willing to do really lame stuff just because I feel like I want to do something about this pandemic. Like I'm willing to do. Yeah, if, if those data tables made sense, I would be willing to read papers and fix them, but they, yep. I don't think they make sense. So. <laughs> I mean, we had nuclear physics PhDs professors doing data entry. And, yeah. you know, that kind of, that was amazing to me. Like, I couldn't ever imagine an environment in real world, you know, normal real world, where people are willing to do these things when they're so overqualified. Yeah, but everybody wants to do something to help. Yeah, because we live in such uncertainty where you can't really do much that you absolutely have desire and need, necessity to have at least something. Yeah, but you want to make sure it's not just a waste of time. Yeah. Getting anybody's wheels. <laughs> Big concern. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I have to jump on another call in eight minutes. Just have no that. problem. We can probably go. Let me see what I can put together with what you've told me mm -hmm. and see if it's anything useful. Perfect. And okay. yeah, and usually just don't hesitate to put something raw and rough because we learned that the best way to, you know, uh, get to the answer is to put up a wrong answer, kind of the Wikipedia way. Mm -hmm. When someone posts something that doesn't make any sense, people jump on it and they're like, hey, someone is wrong on the internet. Let's fix it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So let's try and, and see how it goes. Okay. Um, yeah, it's cool. I mean, if I think of it just in terms of the Medium article or something, it might be interesting to interview, for me to just interview a couple of people, like yeah. maybe talk to Dan a little more, because I only talked to him briefly about sort of a separate project and um yeah so 
So. Yeah, sounds good. Somebody else who you think would be interesting. I think Slava would be amazing. This is the person who has been building search engines for over 20 years. And he's oh. the main like knowledge graph ideator. I barely understand half of the things that he's talking about, but I just believe that that makes sense. So yeah, he would be great to interview. Let's, let's create that initial draft, send it to him and prompt him for, for a call. Okay. Okay. Well, All right. Uh, Sounds uh, good. Touch. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you joining us and, and trying great. to make sense. Oh, of it. You recorded this. <laughs> oh, by the way. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, do you mind if I post to YouTube? Oh, geez. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it, here's the thing. We uh, operate on this weird radical transparency. Every meeting is on our YouTube channel. And I always ask people, by the way, before posting, but uh, that's because many people are not able to join calls or is there is something, you know, meaningful that they could benefit from if they uh, watch the call like you did, you know, you watch the that call with researchers and it was yeah. helpful because it was, it would be impossible for me to give all the context of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just let me know if you're comfortable with it. Uh, yeah, I guess that's okay. I don't know why anybody would want to watch it, but okay. <laughs> and uh, maybe I'll, uh, yeah, I might want to use it myself to, to get my notes. Through. True. True. I use it. That's the primary reason why I started recording it because I was having so many calls. I was forgetting all of it. And then I was rewatching it. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll send you the link. Okay, all right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.